Robert Whitaker and Garrett Till have racked up their own fair share of brutal beatings. And coming into this fight, you couldn't help but wonder who would be on the receiving end of that beating when they faced off. But after the fight played out, there was a certain theme we saw from this fight that told us a story about what happens when evenly matched fighters clash in a technical war. When you have two fighters who are evenly matched in their technical styles, what you often see is that the fighters will constantly notify each other's own moves. Till and Whitaker both describe it like a game of chess, and I have to say that's a pretty accurate description. You would often see a ton of sequences where someone would engage in attack, then you would see the other fighter negate it only for that cycle to continue itself over and over again. It's a pretty frustrating process from the fighter's perspective. And in these kinds of battles, the ones who win are the ones who manage to find the edge in the exchange. Even Whitaker admits how hard this fight was. I tell you what, my brain is on overload. <laughs> I bet it is. I saw you discussing with him after the fight, all the fainting and the, the, the you know the, the flinching. Talk to me about that process oh, and how you try and learn on the spot. I, I tell you what, that that fight was so stressful. <laughs> it's um, it was honestly. Uh, I hope the the fans and everybody can appreciate it because. That level for me was one of the most technical fights I've ever had to fight. Uh, stand up wise, we were both fainting. We both knew our, each other's strengths. He felt me out. I, bl I blitzed him in the first round. He caught me. Didn't do that again. <laughs> so I had to really adapt on the go. Um, it was such a dynamic fight. Things just went his way, then my way, then his way, and fought my way. It was, it was so much fainting, so much committing. And, uh, you know, I, I, the, the takedown got me across the line in the end, eh? Yeah, it was a, a beautiful mix. Even though they would constantly nullify each other, Whitaker managed to win the decision because of the advantages that he had. So the question here is, what are those advantages? Also, what was it about this fight that was such a mental overload for Whitaker? Now, I've done the analysis and I'm going to reveal to you what I discovered when we take a look at the fight between Darren, the Gorilla Till, versus Robert, the Reaper Whitaker. A battle of endless negation. So just as a quick overview of what to expect, we're going to capture the story of the fight by looking at how they negated each other. And some of their signature moves. And then we're going to finish off with possible exploits that both fighters can take advantage of. For a majority of the fight, both fighters had a hard time landing hits on each other, and there were some specific reasons for this. For Till, he fought long, and he also used a lot of feints on Whitaker, and this made it really hard for Whitaker to find his rhythm. You'd see Till feint and bait Whitaker into making a lot of mistakes, then looking to capitalize on it. Till did manage to land some offense of his own, and he did this by using a lot of feints to try to bait out Whitaker's reactions. Now, what he landed the most was by feinting to get a reaction to where Whitaker would start circling away, and that's where we would see Till landing a lot of shots on his guard. Since Till fought long, when he goes on the attack, you'd often see him pull back or evade shots just by a few inches. This is because he fights long. And to fight long, you don't want to overcommit your range too much when you throw your punches. You know you know to throw enough to where mainly the end of your reach touches them. And what this means is that your head is slightly farther away in case you need to evade. And this is important because this allowed Till to slightly evade the head back in shots where Whitaker would try to counter back. Now to give you an idea, Whitaker had an overall hard time landing his shots like his slipping lead hook. This is where you would see Whitaker try to parry with his rear hand and then take his head off the center line to counter with his own lead hook. And you'll still see Till slightly be able to evade the shots as Whitaker tries to counter. Till is using a lot of feints in his fight to find openings, but Whitaker did a really good job of nullifying the feints. Now when you feint, you're typically looking to beta reactions so that you can punish those reactions once you've gotten your reads on what to expect. Now, while most fighters would succumb to the manipulation of feints, fighters who are at a higher level are harder to impose this kind of deception on, and I'll show you why in this next example. So watch as Whitaker blocks from the feint. Now watch as Till feints again, and then now 
Whitaker evades back. Then Till's gonna faint again and you see Whitaker's gonna now do a slip. And then now he's gonna do a circling away while Till tries to follow up. So really important thing to keep in mind that with each feint that Till does, Whitaker does not get the same defensive reaction each time. Now it makes it really hard to predict how to penetrate his defenses when Whitaker does this. So in principle, to avoid being manipulated by feints, you don't want to use the same defenses all the time. Your defenses need to be malleable, like water. This is what it is, okay? I said empty your mind, be formless, shapeless, like water. Now you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now water can flow or it can crash. Be water, my friend. And just like Bruce Lee says, to be water, to be formless, be shapeless, and in the context of fainting, you want your defensive reactions to change. And in a way, you want your defenses to be formless, to have no one static form necessarily. In order for an opponent to find an opening, they have to understand what form you take, but if you become formless, they can't predict what form of defense to destroy. Just to put this into perspective, Whitaker had just come off a fight facing someone who heavily relied on fainting in fighting Israel Adesanya, and his fight with Till just added another barrage of feints to his resume. It's pretty interesting because Whitaker is a nice case study when it comes to understanding how fighters deal with feints. There's another issue I need to highlight. So even though Till could bait the reactions, he couldn't quite find his mark. Whitaker was also just as hard to hit as Till was hard to hit, but Whitaker had his own reasons for this. So Whitaker is a shorter fighter with a similar reach. He doesn't have the luxury of fighting defensively like Till does because he's shorter, so instead he uses the fundamental principles of head movement to avoid damage. So pay attention to Whitaker, he's going to throw his rear hand, but you notice he takes his head off the center line. And then when he's about to throw another rear hand, he's actually going to just move his head laterally, still off that center line. And he's going to throw his rear hand. And you're going to notice in that green angle there that his head is never really in that spot because he avoids that region by using head movement. And then in general, you're going to see a lot of Whitaker using this kind of head movement where he throws his hands a lot, but his head is always off that center line, moving under that center line in order to throw his shots. And Till just has a hard time landing his own shots back because of the head movement. In the first round, Till actually managed to drop Whitaker by timing an elbow right when he blitzed in. Now the leaping hook would normally work against Whitaker's usual opponents, but there was a specific reason why it didn't work against Till. This happens to be a signature move that Whitaker does pretty often. He does this a lot of times especially against uh, Romero in their fight. With this strategy, the basic idea here is that you want to use feints to bait a reaction and then transition into a lead hook after you've created your opening. And I'll show you a clip here of a previous breakdown I did, giving you more examples of how this works. So what Roy's going to do here is throw his rear shoulder as though he's going to throw that straight hand. And that acts as a feint because when he does that, the opponent is going to try to parry that straight shot. But you see Roy transitions into a leaping lead hook to catch that opening instead. So this could be used as a feint to help you transition into a lead hook. And this was also used by Rose Nama Yunus to knock down Joanna in her first title fight. Whitaker's leaping lead hook follows the same idea of using feints to create that opening for that lead hook. However, in this version, he actually throws his hook while taking his head just off the center line where he keeps his head a little bit lower at times so that he can still avoid punches. But the problem is, is when he used it against Till, Till threw an elbow instead. Now the elbow tends to be at the axis of where your head would be positioned if you were to take your head off that center line, which means that the elbow was at the perfect position to punish Whitaker's advancement. 
So just check out this next example where Chris Lyman's going to throw his elbow and he times his elbow right when Mark Munoz steps off his center line to throw his overhand right. You'll also notice that it still lands even though he takes his head off the center. Getting back to the fight, once Whitaker got dropped with that elbow, he pretty much abandoned that signature move for the most part. Till did attempt to time an elbow again but he couldn't quite find the consistency after Whitaker adapted. Now how exactly did he adapt? Well, he just simply chose to not use that tactic again. I blitzed in in the first round, he caught me, didn't do that again. <laughs> this particular tactic was something Whitaker used to knock Till down with. He would move in and control Till's arm. Now what this does is, it takes away his ability to use that weapon to counter back and Whitaker was able to trap him temporarily in order to land his own rear hand. Now keep in mind, Whitaker tried this several times but only found success a small handful of times. This fight was pretty much a constant back and forth struggle for both guys to establish something consistent. Although Whitaker was able to drop Till with this certain strategy, Till would also adapt too by evading the overhand attempts. Just as I mentioned before, Whitaker is actively always moving his head off the center line so Till couldn't quite find his target when he was trying to counter punch. Now the other issue was that Whitaker's punches were very wild so it made it really hard for him to land precise punches. This might be because of his commitment to keep his head off that center line, but his punches may have in theory could have landed. He did have the right execution of strategy, but he lacked the precision to actually find his target. Till has the same issue of moving in while his head's still on that center line, but Whitaker missed his chance to capitalize it on many of these sequences. It was really common to see them constantly notify each other and it was pretty amusing to see because it was a clear sign of how hard the fight was for both the fighters. It also showed that they couldn't really figure out a hole in their opponent's defenses on the most part. And if you look at the fight statistics, it was a pretty low output of offense. Now keep in mind what I revealed to you. You know why Till and Whitaker were hard to hit. Till fought long and he could pull away from punches. While Whitaker was hard to hit because he used a lot of head movement to take his head off that center line in order to avoid damage. You'll see this constant theme in sequences where they would always cancel each other out. Because Till is tall, he won't necessarily benefit from slipping, not as much as Whitaker would. When you're tall and you try to slip a shot, your head tends to fall around the horizontal axis where you could still get hit by the opponent's striking reach and if you pay attention to the photo I have if Till was to slip his head it would fall around where that blue box is and it would be almost close to the range of where Whitaker's natural striking axis would be at so taller guys tend to not use slipping as much he could probably use slips too but he probably just has a stylistic preference to pull his head away more Whitaker had a hard time finding openings, and he talks about this in his next interview. That's the chess match. That's the chess fight. That's why it was so technical. Is because he, we were both trying to to wait for each other, to counter each other, to wait for an, our, each other to to open up, so that they, we could capitalize on on each other's holes. That's why I had to chip away at his defenses from the outside. I had the calf kick. I had to stomp. I had to I had to work on the outside. Not only. Does it do damage, but it also racks up in the scorecards. This next sequence demonstrates this thought process pretty accurately. You're going to notice that Whitaker tries to faint several times, but notices that Till isn't quite biting or presenting any kind of openings. And he was set by moving back or just offering nothing good to work off of. So you'd see Whitaker resort to using kicks to at least score something from the outside. Whitaker also threw a lot of oblique kicks, stomping Till and damaging his knee in the early second round. Till recounts that his leg was compromised beyond that point, but he still played a pretty good poker face and making it appear that he could still move about without drawing too much notice to Whitaker. The second edge Whitaker had was that he was more versatile with his rhythm. He would switch between wrestling and striking rhythms and you'd often see him try to transition from a high crotch into scoring some solid hits on the break after disengaging. So to recap the story of this fight, what we saw was a struggle to establish a rhythm because both fighters ability to nullify each other. 
But as we discussed, Whitaker had just a little bit more versatility with his use of kicks to score from the outside and his use of wrestling to at least score something on the breaks. Now we're at the end of this video and I want to take a look at possible exploits from both fighters and things that they could take advantage of if they do a rematch again. For Teo Whitaker was looking to parry his cross while sweeping his head off that center line to return his signature lead hook. But the problem with that is that he tends to leave his head exposed and it's a good opportunity to land a head kick. And I'll show you an example of how this can be exploited. See that he's gonna throw out that rear hand, he's gonna pump it forward and it almost looks like a cross. So Alex is gonna go for that bait so he's gonna try to slip off slightly try to parry it with that rear hand but you notice that instead of throwing that rear hand a kick actually comes right over the top and he drops him. So similar to the example I showed you what Till could do next time is feint that rear hand just to bait out the counter and then attack from the kicking range so while Whitaker could try to attack from the punching range Till could manage to land that head kick to that exposed opening to where the head is not protected. Aside from the elbow, a flying knee is also a good alternative to counter the leaping lead hook. One of the exploits that Wooder can take advantage of next time is by using combos and ending those combos with late kicks because one of Till's primary reactions is to pull away, but while he's doing that, his legs are still there to get kicked and he can't necessarily pick them up to block or check them. So it'd be a good idea to take advantage of that. Similar to how Volkanovski was able to chain punches and add in kicks into just to punish the movement just in case Holloway moved away. In this match, Whitaker made a point in showing how important it is to be versatile in what you do because the edge that he had in his fight is what made the difference in allowing him to take the victory. You never really know what happens when you find someone who matches your skills so evenly and when that happens, the tide of the battle is likely to fall in favor of the one who has more tools to edge out that win. And this is what we saw in the fight. Whitaker was able to score just a little bit more to tip the decision in his favor. Hey everybody, I just want to say thanks for watching and I appreciate everyone who supports this channel. I have a lot more stuff on my WordPress if you want to see some more analysis work. If you like this analysis work, please subscribe to the channel. Oh, I tell you what, my brain is on overload.